Hamlet, for I Hear Shakespeare. Widely regarded as Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet is probably the single most debated and variously defined of all of Western literature's great works. The copious amounts of books, articles, resources, and productions of the play can overwhelm the first-time reader of the play to the point of inertia. Nevertheless, there are a few main elements surrounding Hamlet that, when kept in mind, offer a means of entering the labyrinthine and sublime world of Hamlet the play and Hamlet the character. Firstly, it is of great value to know that there existed an old Norse legend that featured the hero Amlothi, a name that signifies one who is desperate in battle, who pretended to be mad in order to escape persecution and punishment. This same character receives another later treatment in a tetralogy of Saxo Grammaticus circa 1200, present in the third book using the name Amleth, who exacts a brutal revenge on his uncle, mother, and other parallel characters contained in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, the structure of a son placed in a position of avenging his father but having to feign madness was already in place before Shakespeare put pen to paper. Next, we have evidence that a version of Hamlet, the Ur Hamlet as it is known, was begun no later than 1589, which means that Shakespeare would have had about ten years available to its refinement. Compound these aforementioned ideas with the knowledge that Shakespeare's only son, Hamnet, died in 1596, and Shakespeare's father, John, died in 1601, and the next question becomes, when was Hamlet finished and performed? We know that it was entered into the stationer's register in 1602, but there could have been a performance in late 1600 or sometime in 1601. Knowing that Hamlet involves the relationship between fathers and sons, uncles and nephews, we naturally wonder if there isn't something biographical in Hamlet, especially when we learn that Shakespeare himself is known to have played the role of Hamlet's father's ghost. We add yet another layer when we learn that Hamlet's father's name is also Hamlet. With that in mind, what are we to make of the title? It is an enigma, for to whom does Shakespeare refer? As we read, unfold, and try to understand the many layers that make up the play and the character Hamlet, we find more and more that he is all of us and none of us, and so opens the door to a multitude of interpretations. And now, let's begin Hamlet, for I hear Shakespeare. Act 1, Scene 1 takes us to two sentinels, Bernardo and Francisco, patrolling the castle walls. These incidental characters plant the seeds for the multi-layered play about to be performed as one asks, who's there? A question certainly addressed to the audience as well as the other character whose response is, nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. Francisco exits as Horatio and Marcellus enter. Horatio seems to doubt the ghostly vision that Marcellus and Bernardo describe. As Bernardo recounts their latest sighting, the ghost enters. From Horatio's description of the ghost, we gather that he is still in warlike form. Despite Horatio's requests, the ghost does not speak. Horatio, Bernardo, and Francisco confer and agree that this may be an omen and point to war. The ghost returns but retreats when the cock crows. The trio agree to inform Hamlet what has happened. Scene 2. Claudius, now king, enters with several others and speaks of the recent death of the former king, who was also his brother, and of his recent marriage to Gertrude, who is the former king's widow and mother to Hamlet. Claudius further relays the information that there is the possible threat of invasion by Norway, and so sends two representatives to advise the Norwegian faction to act peaceably. Next, Laertes, son of Polonius, who is an advisor to the king, requests permission to return to France to continue his studies, which King Claudius grants. Claudius next addresses Hamlet and, together with Gertrude, urges him to stop mourning his late father. Claudius also denies Hamlet's request to return to Wittenberg to continue his studies, beseeching him to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye. Hamlet agrees to stay, but only because his mother has asked him to stay. Everyone exits, and Hamlet begins his Oh, that this too, too, solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, soliloquy in which he reflects on the nature of his mother's hasty marriage to Claudius so soon after the death of her first husband, the former king. 
Horatio, Bernardo, and Marcellus enter and tell Hamlet about the ghost they saw. Hamlet agrees to meet them that night. Scene 3 takes the action to Laertes and his sister Ophelia as he is saying goodbye to her. Laertes expresses concern regarding Hamlet's shallow infatuation with her and bids her keep out of the shot in danger of Hamlet's desire. Their father, Polonius, next enters and begins an instruction on how to behave while abroad. Laertes departs and Polonius, after asking about the conversation Ophelia just had with her brother, insists that Ophelia avoid and deny Hamlet's overtures. Ophelia responds with, I shall obey, my lord. Scene 4 takes us into the night where Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus await the appearance of the ghost. In due course, the ghost appears and beckons Hamlet to follow it. The other men try to hold Hamlet back, fearing that it may tempt him toward the cliff and to his death. Hamlet breaks free from their grasp and follows the ghost, but the two men decide they'll follow and bear witness. Scene 5 resumes the action with Hamlet speaking with the ghost of his father, who asks that Hamlet lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. The ghost next explains that it was Claudius who poured a vial of poison into his ear while he was sleeping which killed him. The ghost demands that Hamlet revenge his death and departs saying, Adieu, remember me. Horatio and Marcellus enter and Hamlet demands that they swear to secrecy as to what has passed. From offstage, the ghost echoes Hamlet's request, and the three now have a pact of secrecy. Newly inspired, Hamlet states that they are not to let on that they know something if he, Hamlet, should act strange or odd. Again, they swear to do as Hamlet requests. Hamlet concludes the scene stating, O cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Here concludes Act One of Hamlet, for I hear Shakespeare. Act 2, Scene 1 opens with Polonius sending his servant, Reynaldo, to spy on Laertes in Paris before giving him his allowance money and letters. What we most learn in this conversation between Polonius and Reynaldo is that Polonius can be resourceful in the way he learns about his children. It also suggests that he doesn't trust them entirely. Ophelia next enters and explains to Polonius that Hamlet has just left her quarters, but only after behaving very strangely. Polonius deduces that because he has kept Ophelia away from Hamlet, it has made him mad. Polonius commands Ophelia to go with him to report the matter to King Claudius. Scene 2 finds Claudius and Gertrude holding an informal meeting with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern concerning Hamlet's transformation. Claudius asks Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to avail themselves to Hamlet so that they may learn why Hamlet is acting so strangely. The two men agree and exit. Polonius next enters with the ambassadors sent earlier to Norway, who have news that Fortinbras's invasion has been redirected to Poland. Polonius next divulges the news that Hamlet is lovesick for Ophelia, and produces an enigmatic love note that Hamlet wrote. Polonius suggests that he arrange a meeting between Ophelia and Hamlet, upon which Gertrude and Claudius could eavesdrop. Hamlet suddenly appears, and Gertrude and Claudius exit. Polonius goes to Hamlet only to be outwitted and outspoken by Hamlet. Polonius exits saying, My lord, I will take my leave of you, which Hamlet responds to with, You cannot take from me anything that I will not more willingly part with all, except my life, except my life, except my life. Next, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern enter, and Hamlet dissects their visitation, finally explaining that he knows that these two men were sent by the king and queen to pry into Hamlet's business. Within their conversation lies Hamlet's words, What a piece of work is man. Rosencrantz next informs Hamlet of an acting troupe that is headed toward the castle. The players arrive, and Hamlet welcomes them. Polonius re-enters and announces the players, as if Hamlet didn't already know of their presence. Hamlet demonstrates his prowess for acting, and further supports that he is acting at madness, as he recites a passage from the Trojan War. Hamlet lastly asks the players to play The Murder of Gonzago, which he will amend and modify with writing of his own. Everyone exits, and Hamlet begins his Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I soliloquy, in which he contemplates how he has delayed in avenging the ghost. 
He decides he will wait until after the players have presented their entertainment so that he may observe the king's response. The play's the thing, says Hamlet, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Here concludes Act Two of Hamlet, for I hear Shakespeare. Act 3, Scene 1 takes us to Claudius, who is receiving information from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern regarding Hamlet's behavior. The scene includes Claudius, Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. Guildenstern confesses that he is unable to shed any light on Hamlet's disposition any further than calling it crafty madness, and that Hamlet keeps aloof when they try to bring him on to some confession of his true state. Rosencrantz next explains that Hamlet seemed very excited to learn that there would be an entertainment that evening from the newly arrived acting troupe. Claudius seems genuinely pleased that Hamlet has taken a liking to the players. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern exit, and Claudius asks Gertrude to leave so that he can further discuss with Polonius and Ophelia a strategy for observing Hamlet, who is scheduled to come to visit Ophelia. Gertrude exits, saying to Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanton way again, to both your honors. Polonius plants Ophelia in a spot with a book, and then, as Hamlet approaches, hides nearby with Claudius. Hamlet enters and begins his to be or not to be, that is the question, monologue. Ophelia next tries to return a gift that Hamlet had earlier given her. He denies ever giving her any such thing. Hamlet asks the whereabouts of her father, to which she replies, At home, my lord. Hamlet responds with, Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Which directors have allowed it to mean that Hamlet knows that Polonius is nearby, eavesdropping. Hamlet exits, and Ophelia grieves for him, beginning, Oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown. Ophelia exits as Claudius and Polonius come out of hiding. Claudius disagrees with Polonius's theory that Hamlet is mad because of his love for Ophelia. Claudius next explains that he will send Hamlet to England. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will be his escorts. Polonius persists with his theory that Hamlet's madness sprung from neglected love. Ophelia re-engages the scene and Polonius explains that they overheard the entire conference. Polonius next suggests that they devise a way for him to eavesdrop on Hamlet speaking alone with Gertrude. If that scenario sheds no light on the situation, then sending Hamlet to England seems the next course of action. The scene concludes with Claudius stating, It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. Scene two begins with Hamlet advising the players on how they should act their play that night, beginning with, Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. Polonius, Guildenstern, and Rosencrantz enter, delivering news that the king and queen will attend the performance. They exit, and Horatio enters. Hamlet tells Horatio to watch how Claudius responds to a certain scene within the play. A flourish of trumpets is heard as the king, queen, and others enter to watch the players perform. The players begin by performing a dumb show in which there is only action. A murderer kills a sleeping king by pouring poison into his ear. The murderer takes the king's crown and exits with the king's wife. An intermission next takes place, and then the players resume their entertainment. The player king and the player queen speak. The player queen assures the player king that she would never remarry if he were to die. The player king insists she would. Another player comes forward in the role of Lucianus and pours poison into the player king's ear. At this moment, Claudius rises in distress, calls for light, and exits. Everyone leaves the scene except Horatio and Hamlet, who both agree how guilty Claudius behaved. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern enter and convey that, at the Queen's request, Hamlet go and speak with her before he retires to bed. Hamlet agrees and then upbraids Rosencrantz for trying to spy on him. Polonius next enters with the same news that Queen Gertrude wishes to speak with Hamlet. Hamlet sends everyone away and then readies himself to slay Claudius. Scene 3 takes us to Claudius, who is speaking with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern about their scheduled voyage to England with Hamlet. Polonius next enters with the information that Hamlet is going to Gertrude's chamber. Polonius exits, and Claudius begins reflecting on how he has been enjoying the fruits of killing his brother, the former king, and so has been unable to pray. Claudius finally finds it in himself to pray, crying, Help, angels, bow stubborn knees and heart. 
all may be well. Hamlet enters here and, as he is about to strike, realizes that if he kills Claudius as he is praying, then Claudius will go to heaven. Hamlet decides that he will wait until the opportune moment so that Claudius' soul will be damned and black as hell whereto it will go. Hamlet exits to meet his mother. Alone, Claudius concludes the scene while admitting, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. And so we know that, had Hamlet killed him just moments ago, Claudius would have gone to hell. Scene 4 shows Polonius in Gertrude's chamber, both awaiting Hamlet's visitation. As Hamlet approaches, Polonius hides behind the arras, which is a kind of tapestry. Hamlet enters and, during their conversation, tries to make Gertrude sit down. When he does this, Gertrude cries out and so does Polonius. When Hamlet realizes that he has killed Polonius, he comments that he wished it had been Claudius that he killed, and then proceeds to reprimand his mother for her apathetic behavior and her quick marriage to Claudius. Hamlet implores his mother to repent what's past and not let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, assuring her that he, Hamlet, is not in madness, but mad in craft. Hamlet next assures Gertrude that he will answer in time for the death of Polonius. Hamlet next reminds Gertrude that he must go away to England, escorted by Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, whom he'll trust as adders fanged. Hamlet takes away Polonius's body and bids good night to his mother. Here concludes Act 3 of Hamlet, for I hear Shakespeare. Act 4, Scene 1 begins with Gertrude disclosing to Claudius how Hamlet killed Polonius. Claudius states that Hamlet is a threat to everyone and must be dealt with. Claudius informs Rosencrantz and Guildenstern what's happened and instructs them to intercept Hamlet and bring Polonius's body to the chapel. The scene concludes with Claudius exclaiming, Oh, come away, my soul is full of discord and dismay. Scene 2 finds Hamlet hiding the body of Polonius as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern enter. They demand that Hamlet tell them where he has hidden Polonius' body. Hamlet refuses to tell them, but agrees to go with them to see Claudius. Scene 3 begins with Rosencrantz admitting to Claudius that he has been unable to discover where Hamlet hid Polonius' body. Under guard, Hamlet next enters with Guildenstern. Claudius asks Hamlet where Polonius' body is hidden, only to be met with Hamlet's witty remarks on death and dying. Finally, Hamlet discloses the location of the body, and the king's attendants exit. Claudius next explains that Hamlet is being sent to England for his own good. Hamlet exits, and, on stage alone, Claudius admits that the letters that go with Hamlet to England carry Hamlet's death sentence. Scene 4 takes us to Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and Hamlet, who encounter one of Fortinbras's captains. The captain explains that he is there with his army to win a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. In soliloquy, Hamlet compares his impotent efforts to avenge his father's death with the 20,000 men who will fight and die for something so inconsequential. Hamlet concludes his soliloquy with resolve, stating that, From this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. Scene 5 takes us to a gentleman begging the queen to speak with Ophelia. With Horatio present, Ophelia enters and sings bits of songs to the queen and those present, all the while conveying some hidden unhappy truth. King Claudius enters to witness the unhappy scene. Ophelia exits and Claudius has Horatio follow her for her own safety. Claudius next laments the mental condition of Ophelia, but is soon interrupted by a messenger who delivers the news that Laertes has raised a rebellion against the king. Laertes bursts in and demands to know what happened to his father, Polonius. Claudius denies having killed Polonius, but before he discloses the murderer, Ophelia enters, singing more nonsensical songs about a funeral and distributing flowers to those present. Ophelia sings of her father's death and then exits. Claudius takes Laertes aside to assist in plotting revenge upon the murderer, Hamlet. Scene 6 shows a sailor delivering a letter from Hamlet to Horatio. The letter describes how he was captured by pirates who have since agreed to release him while Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are still headed to England. Horatio then goes with the sailor to reunite with Hamlet. 
Scene 7 takes us to a meeting between Laertes and Claudius. They are interrupted by a messenger who brings a letter from Hamlet with news that he is returning home, alone. We are thus to suspect that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Claudius' henchmen, have been dispatched. Claudius next explains that he cannot act directly against Hamlet because his mother holds him so dear, and he is held in high favor with the people, but Claudius suggests that he'll arrange a fencing match in which he will provide a sharpened blade to Laertes and a blunted blade to Hamlet. Laertes adds further assurance of Hamlet's death by stating that he will place a strong poison on the tip of his blade so that but a scratch will ensure his death. As a backup plan, Claudius shares that he will also place poison in a cup so that when Hamlet drinks, he will surely die. They are interrupted by Queen Gertrude, who brings news that Ophelia, having fallen into a weeping brook, has drowned. Here concludes Act 4 of Hamlet, for I hear Shakespeare. Act 5, Scene 1 begins with two clowns preparing a Christian burial ground for Ophelia, even though her death may have been a suicide. Hamlet and Horatio soon enter, and they come across a skull that one of the clowns has unearthed. Hamlet strikes up a conversation with one of the clowns who has heard of Hamlet's madness. The clown shows Hamlet the skull of Yorick, who was once a court jester and friend to Hamlet. While studying the skull of Yorick, Hamlet meditates on the brevity of life and the inevitability of death. The king, queen, Laertes, a doctor of divinity, and other attendants arrive with Ophelia's body, ready to be buried, and Hamlet and Horatio hide. The doctor of divinity declares that there is nothing more that the church can do since her death was doubtful and she should in ground unsanctified be lodged. Ophelia is laid in the ground and Gertrude places flowers on the grave as Laertes, overcome with grief, leaps into the grave with Ophelia. Hamlet comes out of hiding and the two men begin fighting each other over who loved her more. The king has the two men separated and Hamlet exits. Claudius asks Horatio to go and attend to Hamlet. Claudius then reminds Laertes to remember their plan and be patient. Scene 2 shows Hamlet describing to Horatio how he replaced his name with those of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in the king's letter which originally intended Hamlet's death. Hamlet says he has no remorse for those two since they were schemers and opportunists. Young Orsic next appears and brings word that the king has wagered that Hamlet will win a duel against Laertes. Hamlet agrees to the match, which is hastened by a second lord who requests Hamlet's readiness and relays that the queen advises that he, Hamlet, use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before they begin their match. The lord exits and Horatio warns that Hamlet will lose. Hamlet dismisses Horatio's comment, which was meant to convey not that Hamlet would lose the match, but lose his life. Hamlet understands perfectly well what Horatio meant and replies, There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow, further adding that, If it be now, meaning death, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. With a flourish of trumpets, the scene transitions to the fencing match with the king, queen, Laertes, and others as audience. Before the match begins, the king places Hamlet's hand into Laertes's, and Hamlet asks Laertes's pardon. The two men seem to come to a gentlemanly truce, but quickly return to barbed witticisms as they prepare to duel. Claudius announces that the match should begin, and, with a flourish of trumpets, the two men fight. Hamlet scores the first hit, and Claudius offers the poisoned cup to Hamlet as a congratulatory gesture. Hamlet says he'll wait before he drinks, and so the drink is set aside. Hamlet scores the second hit, and Gertrude announces that she'll drink to her son's fine fencing. Knowing that she is about to drink from the poisoned cup, Claudius interrupts her, saying, Gertrude, do not drink. The queen responds with, I will, my lord, I pray you pardon me. Having observed what has happened, Laertes speaks in an aside, saying, And yet it is almost against my conscience. Hamlet next provokes Laertes, saying, Come for the third, Laertes, you do but dally. 
I pray you pass with your best violence. I'm sure you make a wanton of me. They fight, but Orsic, acting as a referee, declares that neither scored a hit. In the next pass, Laertes wounds Hamlet, and in the scuffle that ensues, they exchange rapiers. Hamlet next cuts Laertes with a poison-tipped rapier of Laertes' own construction as the queen falls. Claudius says that the queen swoons because she sees the two men bleed. The queen says, no, no, the drink, the drink, I am poisoned, and she dies. Hamlet cries out for the doors to be locked so that the culprit may be found. Laertes admits that he did it, and further professes that Hamlet is poisoned too, by the tip of the blade, finally stating that the king's to blame. Hamlet takes up the poisoned sword and cuts the king. Hamlet next takes the poisoned cup and pours the drink into the king's mouth, exclaiming, Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion. And the king dies. In a final noble act, Laertes says, Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. And then he dies. Realizing that he is about to die, Hamlet asks Horatio to report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Horatio wishes to follow Hamlet in his death, but Hamlet takes the poison cup away, saying that Horatio must live to tell Hamlet's story. Orsic next announces the return of Fortinbras from Poland. Hamlet announces that Fortinbras is to be his successor. Hamlet's last words are, The rest is silence. Horatio punctuates Hamlet's passing by saying, Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Fortinbras next enters and stands amazed at the sight of all the dead royalty before him. Horatio promises to unfold what happened truly. Fortinbras orders a stately funeral for Hamlet, concluding the play with, Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. Within this, Shakespeare's most lengthy play, we still, to this day, search for greater understanding and comprehension. Here concludes Act 5 of Hamlet for I Hear Shakespeare.